So this is the this is the part two of uh, lecture lecture three. Now, so let's continue here. Now, when you talk about a stem plot, or when you want to describe uh, a stem plot, or when you want to interpret it, you know, get some information, you need to look into three things in here. Okay, three factors if you want to call them: shape of the stem plot, location of the stem plot, spread. So shape, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by the shape, um, you know, because his stem plot describes how the data is distributed. So the shape means, okay, from the shape we can gather uh, for what values, for what measurements uh, <clears throat> are more popular, uh, more common, uh, things like that. Um, so now, and the location, location is where is the data centered around. It is kind of like your GPA. Um, so location is like um, like where the data is, set, data is centered around. It is kind of like your GPA. Now, if, if a student has a GPA of 3.0, you can kind of say that, okay, overall, you know, the person has mostly Bs, some As to balance out the Cs, and then overall you get a GPA is a GPA of, uh, of a B, right? So, which means most of the data is centered around um, the mean. Okay. The mean, which is actually, uh, I spoke a little bit ahead here, um, mean or the average is some measure where, you know, which indicates the location, okay? In fact, we'll talk about this uh, in the next slide. Uh, so, uh, so sh shape is one thing to look for, location is something to look for, and the spread also. You know, you, you may you may notice when we see more plots um, that there are some stem plots which are very much spread out and some which are not as much. Uh, so now that is also a factor that you need to look into because if you have the data to be really spread out, that means data is very variable. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you have data to be extremely variable, that means that data set is not that reliable um, because, you know, the measurements are not close to each other, okay? Uh, so things like that uh, you need to look uh, when you examine a stem plot. A stem plot. <clears throat> okay, so let's go to the next uh, slide here. Um, okay, so the first thing um, that we need to look in uh, stem plots would be shape, as I talked about in the previous slide. Now, when you look at shape, you need to look into these features or, or these factors, okay? Symmetry, I mean, you get a, you have an idea what symmetry is, you know, we'll, we'll learn more about it. Then modality, modality is number of peaks, you know, how many peaks are there? And, you know, peaks are, the technical term for peaks is like modes. And then kurtosis. Now, kurtosis is something that we need not worry too much, but uh, I have uh, explained right here uh, what kurtosis is. If you have, um, you know, um, so you, you, you may read this sentence if you like, but that is something that you need to not worry too much. Typically, if you have a pretty sharp peak around the mean, okay, then the kurtosis, uh, you know, is something which where you have wide tails um, as opposed to a distribution where you have the the peak to be not as high but to be flat okay um, so a low kurtosis means a flat top um, around the mean and a high kurtosis mean like the, <clears throat> um, you know you have a very high peak okay all right now, so let's not worry too much about kurtosis. Now, departures. Departures are like outliers. Now, this is an important thing. Outliers are unusual observations. Um, now, those are things that sometimes may not be good to have in a data set. So, outliers you need to, if you think that particular outliers or, or unusual observations do not belong in that data set, uh, you know, you should remove them. Okay. Now, in fact, I have mentioned an example of an outlier here. Um, just one blood sugar reading of 200, uh, you know, from a non-diabetic uh, person. Now, now this person, if, if that person's average blood sugar is 100, 
and if one day the fasting blood sugar is 200 that means something has gone wrong so this hints of some other thing because this is this 200 does not belong to this person's normal blood sugar levels so that this is an outlier so this could be either a recording error maybe maybe there was like 100 was recorded as 200 it could be that uh, or this could be a genuine reading. If it is a genuine reading, that means this person, you know, is having some unexpected medical condition. Okay, so outliers are some things that you need to be concerned about. All right. Uh, okay, so symmetry, modality, uh, outliers are the important things uh, when you interpret uh, stem plot. Kurtosis, you can be concerned if you like to, but you know, I don't have. Uh, I'm just telling you, you don't have to worry too much about this um, kurtosis in this class, okay? All right. So next, go to the next uh, uh, next slide here. Okay. So we talked about shape. Now next thing is location. Now when you talk about the location, where is the data centered around? Now there are two measures of location. First one is the mean. Mean is nothing but the average, okay? And then also the middle value, which is the median. Okay. Now median is nothing but the 50th percentile. See, percentile is the 50% of. So 50% mark, where 50% of the observations are below that and 50% are above it. In fact, I think I will talk uh, more about percentiles in the next slide, I think, and then also later. Okay. So actually in this course, as we go along, I will be talking about the same thing few a few times. But that way it's, it will help you to sort of, you know, learn something, learn one thing, not just once, several times. And at the same time, it is important to do it that way because we will be learning so many new ideas and terms and things like that. So, sort of, uh, you know, <clears throat> refreshing your memory by talking about this several times, I think is a good, good idea, okay? So, even if you're bored, I think it's worthwhile, all right? So, okay, so let's, this is the median. So, median and mean are uh, measures of location, okay? Now, let's go to the next slide. Um, spread. Remember, we talked about spread being the last factor. Now, to measure spread, you can um, use the range or something new called interquartile range. Okay. Now, range is, you know, as you may guess, is just the minimum to maximum. Okay. And you just say, okay, 20 to 30, something like that. Okay. Now, interquartile range is the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile. And there is a typo here. This should be 75th percentile okay now what is the 25th percentile just like what i said about the 50th percentile before which was the median 25th percentile is the measurement where 25 percent of the observations are below it so what percentage will be above it 75 percent correct okay now likewise 75th percentile would be the measurement uh, at which 75% of the observations will be below it. And then what percentage will be above it? 25%. Correct? Okay. So interquartile range, range, those are two measures that you can uh, get an idea of spread. And then also we have another important measure called standard deviation. Of course, this is the most commonly used. And we will be talking about it in good detail in Chapter 4 about that, okay? Now, just to get, give you an idea, there is a connection between standard deviation and variance. Standard deviation is the square root of the variance, okay? Now, I have also put in a small note in here because I talked about percentiles for 25th, 75th, and in the earlier slide, 50th, which is the median. In general, you can talk about the pth percentile, if you like notation. Pth percentile is the measurement value at which p percent are below it. Okay? We do, you don't have to worry too much about this if you do not want to. Um, okay. But in, 
but you know this kind of idea would be useful in later uh, later courses if you if you intend taking more advanced statistics courses okay all right so let's go to the next slide okay so here uh, we have that uh, stem plot that we did earlier let's talk about you know how we can sort of interpret this stem plot in terms of uh, you know the three things we talked about shape location and also spread now here <coughs> when you talk about shape remember we need to think about symmetry modality and kurtosis not worry about kurtosis much now is this data uh, symmetric no it's not symmetric by the way remember see these crosses represent leaves in that very original stem plot okay only thing is they have in, in here, the, the digits are removed and replaced by just the X symbol, okay? Now, what this says is there are like 420s. So now, the data is not symmetric, you know. So it's not a symmetric stem plot. And, of course, there is a peak. See, in the 20s, you will find a peak. So mode is somewhere here. And then, uh, kurtosis, let's not worry too much. Uh, and outliers, I mean, it's difficult to figure out an outlier with such a small number of data points. So I'm not going to talk too much about that in here. But later on, I think we will have another stem plot, um, you know, which illustrates the idea of a outlier. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next slide now. Um, so here's another one. Of course, you know, we still haven't spoken about histograms. So, but you may be knowing what a histogram is from your previous stat knowledge or even by reading articles and so forth. Um, now, see, uh, just to give you an idea of what the histogram represents. Now, on the x-axis, you have the measurement. Typically, you know, mathematically, we will use the symbol x for the measurement, right? So, in this particular example, measurement is a score. So you, you have the data going from 55 to a little bit more over 140. And then on the y-axis, what they have done is they have figured out the number of individuals scoring each particular range in the score. Okay. Now, another technical term here, number of, number of individuals here would be frequency. Frequency means the count. Okay. So now when you do the... When you do the histogram for this data set, you, you get this shape, okay? Now, look, this is really symmetric, isn't it? It's symmetric, and then also there is only one peak, so it is a single mode situation, okay? And also, remember, I have mentioned something in here. If you have the data to be symmetric, it will be... Uh, such that the mean, which is the average, will be equal to the median and also will be equal to the mode. Okay. Now, this kind of distribution is also called bell-shaped because it is in the shape of a bell. Okay. So this is a nice histogram, and you know, lots of data, lots of real-life data fits into this. All right. Okay. So let's go to the next slide now. Mm. So some more pictures now. <clears throat> Uh, you know, you could have data distributions to be quite varied, not just the bell shape as we saw before. Uh, now, this is, of course, symmetric and bell shaped, as I said. Now, this is still symmetric. You see, right from the, right at this middle point, the data is symmetric, okay? And actually, this will be the mean and also the median, but it is not bell shaped. So, the idea here is to illustrate that you know, not only bell-shaped curves are symmetric, okay? All right, let's go to some more here. Here's another symmetric distribution. Now, in here, it is symmetric, uh, you know, you, you can see that, and it is like the, it doesn't have any single peak or a mode, right? Everything has the same frequency. Every measurement value here has the same frequency, okay? So here... There is no single mode, okay? And, of course, the mean and the median are the same. You cannot talk anything about the mode, okay? No single mode. Nothing standing out. Now, this is 
this has two modes you see that two peaks so this is bimodal okay and it it is not symmetric either so now if you have distributions to be not symmetric they are called asymmetric okay now when you talk about asymmetric distributions uh, we need to talk we need to talk about another thing uh, called skew skewness uh, you know I'm very soon we'll be talking about that let's see um, in fact yeah, right here so here the both these are asymmetric right or non symmetric um, so, moment you have a non-symmetric or a asymmetric distribution, that means the data is skewed. Now, it could be that it's skewed to one side over the other. So, now if you have the hump or the mode to be on the um, on the left side, okay, it is called positive skew. Now, posi positive skew is also called skewed to the right. Because see, there are no data on the right. So this is skewed to the right. This is skewed to the left. Okay. Now, how will you interpret this, such a distribution as far as data goes? What does this mean? There's more data which have low values. See, you know that on the x-axis, the data, the measurement values keep on increasing, right? Starts from maybe zero to keeps on going that way. Zero to hundred, whatever, whatever. Okay, it keeps on increasing this way. So now the hump is more on this side, which means if you have a positively skewed distribution, data is mostly on the lower range than on the high values. Now it's the opposite when you have negatively skewed. The data tend to be more, taking much higher values. Most of the data, more data is higher um, for the negatively skewed distributions. Okay? Right, let's go to the next one. Now here, uh, these are two examples where, you know, it illustrates the idea of modality, number of peaks. Here, there's one single mode. It is unimodal. Here, it is bimodal. Okay. So, I mean, this is, of course, the most common one. But this kind of distribution is not that uncommon either. Um, you know, um, sometimes, you know, like when you have very large classes, uh, you know, there are, Good number of students who get pretty high B plus, A minus, around there, yes. around here, these are like A's, right? And then also a good number getting like C's and D's in here. These are of course F's. You don't get that many F's either. So here it's like a, you know, like a C, D area and B plus, A minus area. Okay. Okay, next one. Um, okay, kurtosis. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I, you don't have to really not know too much about it. As you can see, you know, these terms are really too, <laughs> um, you know, too hard to in fact remember. So let's skip this slide. It's okay, but you know, just for completeness' sake, I will. Um, I will keep it there. See, as I said, you know, kurtosis is a measure of the steepness. See, if you have the peak to be really high, and you know, here it is much flatter, and so forth. This is really steep. So this has this has skinny tails. See, this means this high kurtosis. Okay. Okay. Next one. Okay. So next go to the next one. Um, Okay, now, so we talked about shape. Now let's talk about the location, okay? Now to get the mean, mean is the average. If you have a small data set like this, you can just eyeball it. Of course, you know, that doesn't happen uh, almost always. Uh, you know, typically, we all will calculate the mean, which is the arithmetic method. You just add the numbers and divide by n. I'm sure all of you know how to do that. So you get 290 by adding all these numbers. Remember, you need to, to get the actual values. You need to combine the stem with the leaf and multiply by the x multiplier, which was 10, remember? So you have uh, 5, 11, 21, 24, 27, 28. Like that, you will have those observations and you will add them up to get 290. And there are altogether 10 observations. So little n, little n here is 10. 
So you divide and then you get the mean to be 29. Okay. Of course, if you eyeball it, you can sort of see, hey, the average is somewhere somewhere here. So that's what, you know, they say it's between 25 to 30. Okay. All right, then. So let's go to the next one where we talk about the median. So median is the 50th percentile. Now, to get the median, remember, you need to order the data. Order means you need to write it in increasing order and then get the halfway point. Okay. Now, of course, when you do this by hand, uh, you may want to know, okay, what do you do if you have, if you have n to be odd, like maybe 11, you, you know that, okay, then it will be like the sixth observation is the median once you have the data uh, in increasing order. But if you have even numbers, what do you do? Uh, even number of observations. What you do is you take the average of the two middle points, okay? So that's what they talk about in here. So you have n to be 10, it's, which is even. So you add another one. So it's in, you take n plus 1, okay? So n plus 1, and you divide it by 2 um, um, to get 5.5. .5. So 5.5 .5 is like the, you know, the observation in between 5 and 6. Another way to do is actually just take the two middle observations, two middle observations, and find the average. So these are the two middle observations, and then you find the average, um, you know, to get the median. Okay. Of course, we'll be talking about um, <clears throat> the median again in later in chapter four. But um, think ab think about this now. What if you have like uh, measurements, like hundred, hundred, even hundred measurements? It's not going to be easy to order it. So let's thank the computers for that. So before computers, you know, finding the median was so, so difficult, okay? So in fact, that could have been one reason why mean was, mean is still more well known than the median is. But median is also a good measure of location, but because it's hard to uh, calculate, when you, if you do not have a computer, uh, median is not much used. Of course, nowadays it is being used because we can always use computer, like stat, uh, so, uh, software, uh, to compute it. Okay? All right. Um, so let's go to the next one. So the range. Now, remember we talked about measures of range. The range itself, minimum to maximum, so it's like 5 to 52. And then, of course, this is really, really you know, it's very little information that you get from the range. You do not know what is hap what is in, in between. So if you say the data is between uh, from 5 to 52, it could be that so many are around 5 and just 1, 52. It doesn't say how spread out the data is. It doesn't say are there 20s, are there 30s. So this range is a very poor measure of range, okay? Okay, so let's talk, uh, go to the next one. Um, okay, so um, in fact, uh, let me go back to this slide again. Now, we talked about interquartile range and also the standard deviation. Now, uh, those are the other two measures of spread. Now, we, uh, the, in this lecture, we are not going to talk about those, but later on in another chapter, we'll be talking more about them. Definitely, the standard deviation is going to be a very important measure for us. So, we will be talking about that in Chapter 4. Okay, now um, then you have some more examples uh, in this presentation uh, which you can go, uh, you know, just go over by yourself. But uh, actually, I'm going to skip a good bit of those um, and then, you know, may go to a slide much later on. But if you have any questions uh, in the slides that I'm not going to go over, uh, please, you know, uh, get in touch with me. Okay, so let me go down. Um, and then go down further. Yeah, now I'm going to, so I skipped a few uh, good bit of slides. So I'm in slide uh, 30 now. And then, okay, let me talk about this one. Because, see, here this is a stem plot which is obtained using this statistical software called SPSS. 
okay now spss is a pretty good software which is very widely used in public health and medicine and so forth now in addition of course there are other software like minitab and sas and so forth now spss is available at in penn state um, networks um, uh, and then, uh, if you like, you know, you can play with it at Penn State York, the labs you have, and of course, in, in, in Penn State uh, main campus or even in other branch campuses, uh, in the computer labs, SPSS should be available, okay? Now, um, now the stem plot that you get using SPSS is like this. So, and also I want to remind you that, uh, you know, if you use different software, there would be certain unique things, you know, uh, corresponding to each one of them. So a good idea would be always to, you know, to read the manual or go into the help menu and then see an example. Okay. So now in the SPSS stem plot, uh, let me, so right here are the stems. Here you have lots of leaves with a very large data set. So this like zero kind of thing that uh, in fact this each one is a leaf. Okay. Now when you have large data sets, this one single leaf could represent several observations. So the, that fact is mentioned in here. See it says that each leaf is equal to two cases. Now this is something unique to SPSS as far as I know. Case is an observation for SPSS. Because see, the case is like, like a patient, like, you know, in, in medical terms of public health. So case is an observation, measurement, and so forth, okay? Now for this uh, stem plot, each of these leaf represents two cases or two observations, okay? That is why, now see, for each of these rows, each, there is the frequency mentioned here. That is why you have two, because this one, this little, Leaf contains two observations. Now there are, of course, four of them. Okay, it should have been a, a eight, but see, sometimes when you have half, we will sort of round it up. Uh, no, they won't round it up. Uh, they they will they will mention how many there are, but they will not put the half. Uh, you know, half of that symbol. Now there are some other software which, in fact, puts the the half symbol, but here they have not. So here you have eight, but this frequency tells there's one more. Okay. Now also remember, uh, how do you get the actual observations? This is like 3.0, and remember in the previous example we talked, uh, we multiplied by the x multiplier. Okay. In the SPSS version, stem width is the same as the x multiplier. So that's what I have mentioned in here. Please read these notes. Stem width is the x multiplier, and in here it says it is one. Okay, so that means the observations are the stem and leaf combined as they are. So 3.0 is one observation, uh, 4.0 is the, the next one, another 4.0, and so forth. Now something bad about um, you know um, this SPSS uh, stem plot is. It does not differentiate the ones. See, we do not know whether this is 4.2 and whether this is 4.8 and so forth. Okay. Uh, so this is the best you can do when you have, you know, large data sets. All you can say is, okay, there are nine observations which are in the 4.0 range. Okay. All right then. Um, so now look, here are the extremes. Now this SPSS system plot tells you the extreme values. Now again, the extreme means outliers. Okay. See, as I said, um, you know, different uh, software use different um, terms. Um, extreme is the same as the outlier. Okay. All right then. Uh, let's see. Should I talk about anything else in here? No. Okay. Now, how in in fact in here they don't give you what n is. n is the total number of observations. How do you find n? n would be actually, um, you know, you need to add all this up. In fact, I have asked another question here. What is the proportion of observations less than 48? So how do you find that? Now see, 48 
Uh, oops, I think I made a mistake in here. It should be 4.8. 4.8. Um, so now 4.8, you have to make a guess. 4.8 is somewhere here. I could say, okay, maybe 4.8 is like the third, third symbol in here. So you, I could say that, okay, to calculate the proportion less than 4.8, uh, you need to add up this 2 and then the number up to here. So that will be like 2 plus 4, 6, 8. Wait a minute, I think I made a mistake. No, yeah, right, 6, uh, yeah, 2 plus uh, 2 plus um, 2 plus uh, 2, 4, 6, 8. So there are 8 observations less than 4.8 and you divide by um, the, why did I put the 10 in here? Hmm, I guess, I guess I may have taken Halfway, I have taken halfway here. I think. Uh, let me see. I got stuck here. A uh, two. So I have put. Uh, so yeah, I think. I think uh, when I. When I prepared the notes, I estimated uh, 4.8 to be the last observation. So, this, so there would be like 8 in here. 8 plus 2 will give you 10. Okay. Now again, I have, uh, I should put 8 over n to get the proportion. Okay. 8 over n would be the proportion. There's a typo in there, so I'm going to correct that as well. Okay. Um, so, in fact, let me correct this. It should be 4.8. All right. So, you guys are good to go. Um, all right, then. So, uh, SPSS, um, you know, is a, is a pretty uh, common software. So, you know, learning how to interpret stem plots of SPSS would be useful. So, that's why I put this. Okay. So, let's go to the next, uh, next slide. Now, here we are starting um, to talk about the next um, subtopic in this lesson which are frequency tables okay in simple terms as you guys may all know frequency is the count okay now see in this particular data set they have different ages and then what they have done is okay they are looking to see how many people are belonging to different ages okay in fact these people are like kids right um so there are two kids who are three years old, nine kids who are four years old, and so forth. So frequency is the count. Okay. Now we need to understand a few other terms. Relative frequency, important. Relative frequency is the proportion up to a level. Okay. So how do you do? How do you get the proportion? In fact, I have done an example in here. Um, uh, let's see. First of all, n equals 654, as I said. Even in the stem plot, if you add up all the frequencies, you get the total number of observations. So, n equals 654. Now, to get the relative frequency for age at level 4. See, each of these is like a, a level for age. So, a, age at level 4 would be um, um, would be equal to what? How many um, are at uh, age 4? 9. So, you have frequency to be 9 divided by 64 to get 0. Uh, I should put an equal there, uh, 0. 0.138, and that is approximately 1.4%. Now, by the way, uh, you guys know that, um, you know, uh, proportions and per percentages are equivalent, right? Uh, you know, you can get the percentage by multiplying the proportion by the 100. So that is what's being done in here. When you multiply... 0.138 by 100, you get a 1.38, which is rounded up to 1.4, you know, as it is done in this chart here. Okay? Alright. So now that's how you calculate the relative frequency. Now let's go to the cumulative frequency. Cumulative frequency is the proportion, percentage less than or equal to a given level. Okay? 
Um, in fact, I think it should be called cumulative relative frequency. Um, but the book has it at least the. Okay, let's see, relative frequency. But. Uh, so then. <clears throat> So to get the cumulative relative frequency, what you do is you have to count how many observations there are up to that point. So let's, in fact, I have done it in here up to, okay, if you want to get the cumulative frequency up to 5, so you need to add 2 plus 9 plus 28, and then you divide by 654 to get 0.059. And that is actually a 5.9, which is rounded up to be equal to 6.0. So 6, 6. is the cumulative relative frequency. That means this is the proportion of observations less than or equal to 5. Okay? So up to that point. All right? So now these are important stuff. Uh, please, you know, go over this slide again, um, you know, because uh, I, I think these are something new that you might, uh, you know, you, you might be coming across these terms for the first time. Okay, all right. So let's go to the next one. Um, um, yeah. Now, when data are sparse, you need to group the data into class intervals. Okay. So rather than take single observations like what was done in the previous slide, you need to break it into or divide it into small groups, and then and then um, you know take the number of observations belonging to each group, and then calculate the uh, frequency for each group, relative frequency, and then the cumulative frequency. Okay. So now by doing that, see now <coughs> this is an example um, that they have done in here. So uh, when you look in here, you can uh, see that okay, here's the data. Uh, they have formed classes, same as groups. Okay. Um, you know, I can just put that in here. Um, you know, actually, uh, the term class is used quite, uh, you know, quite a lot. So it's good to sort of uh, get to know it. Um, and then uh, the sort of okay. Um, so now uh, you you take a tally. You you cut each of these observations, and then you know, uh, and then you know. Um, figure out to which class each of these observations belong and then you, you can figure out the frequency and then you get the relative frequency by dividing each of the frequency by by n which is 10 in this particular example and then cumulative you keep on adding see now you can see that cumulative frequency here is the same as the relative frequency for the first class or even for the first observation uh, in the previous slide. So you have 1 over 10. Now for the second one, it will be 1 plus 1, which is 2 over 10. So it's, it's 2 over 10, which is 20%, right? Then for the third one, it will be 1 plus 1 plus 4, which is 6. 6 over 10 is 60% and so forth, okay? And you can see when you keep on adding everything, um, the cumulative relative frequency for the last group or for the last observation would be 100% because you are including everything, right? Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now here's a histogram. Now this is the first time we are sort of uh, talking about a histogram. See, histogram is nothing but, you know, you have the grouped data, at least the classes mentioned on the horizontal axis. Okay, now here these are the age classes. It's the same, uh, you know, what we got from the previous frequency table. Actually, to calculate or to construct the histogram, we use the frequency table. So we do the, or we, we mark down the groups on the horizontal axis. And then on the vertical axis, you will have the frequency for each group, okay? So now, if you remember, between 0 through 9, there was one person. 10 to 19, there was one person and so forth, okay? Now, some histograms have relative frequency on the vertical axis, okay? Um, but in this one, they have, um, they have just the plain frequency, all right? Okay, um, 
So now let's see. Um, again, now how do you find the sample size? You know, you can you can find it by just adding up all these frequencies, right? One plus one plus four plus one plus one plus two gives you ten. Okay, for any histogram that works. Now, again, what's the proportion of individuals at least twenty nine years of age? So twenty nine is the end of this group or this class. So how many are there? First of all, let's see in a histogram how how can we see it's one plus one plus four which will be which will be six six over ten is 0.6 so 60 percent are at least oops not at least at most i'm sorry it should be at most at most okay at most 29 years of age all right okay then um so histogram gives us some useful information in fact, it tells you, okay, the most most individuals are in the 20 to 29 age group, right? And there are some in the 50 to 59 group. Just only two, of course. All right? Okay, so let's go to the next one. So now remember, histograms and stem plots are for quantitative data. If you, if you remember way, way back at the beginning of the lecture, uh, you know, we, we discussed it, okay? So histograms and stem plots are for quantitative data because to do cons uh, to do histograms and stem plots we need the property of numbers. Number properties are used. So because of that, both these graphical methods, histograms and um, stem plots, work only for quantitative data. Okay. Now let's go to the next one. Here's a bar chart. Bar chart is for categorical data. Now, also, let me go back to the the previous um, previous slide here. In fact, it's right here. Histograms in histograms, these bars do touch each other because see, these are just these are just adjacent groups, zero to nine, and then right after that, nine to like you know, right after that, you get ten to nineteen. These are connected. Visually, that's the major difference between histogram and a bar chart. For a bar chart, see, we do bar charts only for categorical data. Categorical means data need not be numerical. It doesn't have numbers. It is just based on a property or a characteristic. In here it is, you know, which school level are you in, okay? So there is no connection. So because of that, the bars are disconnected. They have to be it should not be touching. They should not be adjacent. Okay. So bar chart is a graphical method for categorical data. And then so again, it's a frequency. See, you will write down the categories on the horizontal axis and then the count or the frequencies on the vertical axis. So you can see again, you can figure out the sample size if you see a bar chart. And if they do not give you the sample size, you can figure out the the sample size just by adding the heights here. That's I think what I have done in here, okay? At least approximately. And then also you can get the proportion of elementary school kids. Um, let's see, what have I done? Yeah, elementary school kids would be altogether 450 out of how many? 640. And then this is the proportion. And if you want to get the, the uh, percentage, you know what to do, right? So you just multiply by 100. It's like about 71.87, um, which is percent, which is almost like, I'll just say, equal to uh, 70, 72%, right? If you want to round up, 72%. 72% in this data set, in this sample, are uh, um, elementary school kids, okay? All right, so bar chart is one graphical method for um, categorical data. The next one is a pie chart. So here's the pie chart. Now, how do you get these? See, each of these wedges, if you want to call them, represent the categories. How do you get the exact size of the wedge? So if the angle, the angle of each wedge, you get by uh, multiplying the relative frequency by 360. Okay. Um, so I don't know why I have mentioned over here. Um, so all you have to do is go back in here. So here you have the relative frequency. 
multiply this by 360 to get the, um, the degrees for each angle and then you draw it. Of course, you know, you need the protractor and stuff like that to do a pie chart, but these days you're not going to worry about doing a pie chart by hand. We will all this is a, a software like SPSS, Excel does it, and even Minitab. Okay, all right. I think I have come to the end of this um, presentation. Um, you know, if you have any questions, uh, you need to get back to me. Okay, all right then. Thank you.